How does the Christian church grow? I ask that question assuming something. I'm assuming that you have an interest in the answer. I'm believing that you would be interested in knowing how the Christian church grows because I'm believing that you're invested in the church of God, that you have a heart to see the gospel bearing fruit and the kingdom of God extending its borders. I'm hopeful today that while you rejoice in your salvation, you do not see it as simply a private transaction that has occurred between you and the Almighty, and that you recognize the responsibility that comes with being saved, and that you nod your head in agreement with a preacher's words from a century and a half ago, God hath shined in our hearts that we might give to others the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Saints, we are mercifully saved for God's glory, for our good, and for the sake of others. And since that is the case, the growth of the Christian church is every, every believer's business, and that it happens is every believer's interest. How does the Christian church grow? Is there a formula? Is there a recipe we could follow to grow the church? In an article that was written about 20 years ago, Pastor Mark Dever said this, Many people from bureaucrats in declining denominations to sociologists of religion to earnest young evangelical pastors would like to know what a growing church is like and how to have one. According to the advertisement in a recent issue of one prominent evangelical magazine, churches can grow by attending a seminar on effectively training church leaders in the local church by ordering some new Sunday school literature, by buying electrical communications gear from a store in Alabama, by picking the right study Bible or Christian book, the right college or seminary. One prominent seminary, if you enroll, claims to empower you to be a world changer. Despite these possibilities and promises, and you will find many more if you type your opening question into your search bar, how does the church grow? Pastor Dever concludes that fundamentally, a growing church is made up of growing Christians. And that is just the story that Luke tells us in the book of Acts. Growing Christians are fueling the growing church because they are preaching Jesus. Our Father, we bow our heads before you now. We sit under your word and we come seeking you to teach us. And you wrote this book. You know what it means. And we pray that you'll help us to understand. In Jesus' name, amen. Our text this morning is Acts 11, verses 19 to 21. We continue on the journey through Acts. Very appreciative of those who are able to stand in in my absence and, and deliver you the word. And now we're getting back to Acts. We're in Acts 11, verses 19 to 21. So if you have your Bible with you this morning, I'd encourage you to turn with me there. We'll take a look at just these three verses. If you don't have a Bible with you this morning, you'll find one. And the seat rack in front of you and the Bible provided, our passage today is, is on page 1093. 1093, Acts chapter 11, verses 19 to 21. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. In this passage, the message of the gospel, the good news of eternal salvation in Jesus is preached to the people of Antioch, which is a city outside of Israel, several hundred miles to the north of Jerusalem. Men from Cyprus and Cyrene, that is from a Mediterranean island and from the north of Africa, have gone to Antioch. And we noted that we began this passage several weeks ago, and there we noted 
that most often for the church to grow, its members must go. Heeding the call of God, these men went. They went to Antioch in order to preach. The word in our passage that is translated preach is a word that we are all familiar with. Uh, Uangelizo, no, we're not familiar with the Greek, but we are familiar with this idea of evangelize and evangelism. That's what's going on here. These men have come to evangelize in Antioch. To evangelize mm -hmm. means to declare, to announce good news. And in declaring the good news of the salvation that is found in Jesus Christ, these men met with great success. Verse 21 of our text says, Many believed, uh, many believed what these men were saying, and many turned to the Lord. It has been noted previously, we don't even know these men's names. So here they are, having this great evangelistic success. These no name, no glory, no pedigree preachers. And we might wonder, and we probably should wonder, how do such ordinary guys meet with such extraordinary success? How were they so successful in their evangelism? Why did anyone listen to them? Why did anyone accept the words they were giving is truth. Why would anybody get saved under their ministry? Our text gives us two reasons for these men's effectiveness in evangelism. Two key ingredients in their approach that we would do well to include in our approach. That's why I'm sharing these with you today. Two key ingredients to their approach that we would do well to include in our approach to sharing Jesus. First, we see that's just what they were doing, lifting up Jesus. They were preaching the Lord Jesus. And second, Luke tells us the hand of the Lord was with them. So we'll take those two in order this morning. They were preaching the Lord Jesus. Even though the specific content of their sermons is not recorded in the book of Acts, we have enough here to notice a bit of a shift, a bit of a a shift in emphasis of the preaching that had been going on earlier, say, in Jerusalem, even the surrounding areas. It's different than what's happening in Antioch. It's different from the sermons, say, that Peter preached that we've read through already. These anonymous, pioneering, Gentile preachers are not following the pattern exactly that Peter set or that others set, declaring Jesus first as the Messiah, that their audience had missed. You remember those sermons? Peter frequently said that Jesus was the Messiah and you killed him. It wasn't just that you missed, you killed him. You did away with him. That was the emphasis. But that message would only have meaning for people who were of the Jewish background. Uh, that cared or knew about the Jewish scriptures. The audience here in Antioch is not Jewish. It is primarily Gentile. And beyond that, it is massively diverse. Antioch is a, a city that is a hub of trade. So people from all over the region, people from everywhere, are coming and going through this city. And in this city, there are people representing all sorts of ethnicities and all sorts of beliefs. And they have all sorts of what we would call little G gods. There are idols everywhere, all through the city. They had their deities. And these unnamed preachers are holding up Jesus in this context and saying to them, this is the true one. Here is the true king. Here is the Lord of lords. Here is the one who can truly deliver you. Here is the one who defeated death so that you can too. Here is the one who's worthy of your worship. Here is the one worthy of your lives above all others. They preached the Lord Jesus. Not just a historical Jesus. Not a story about a charismatic son of a Jewish 
carpenter who ran afoul of the Roman government and was crucified. Not just a philosophical Jesus, a man who spoke with unparalleled authority and wisdom. Not just a radical Jesus who defied convention by the people he hung out with and ate with and the way that he challenged the religious elite of his day, but the Lord Jesus, the Greek word kurios, it means master, master Jesus. Listen, of all the tasks given a Christian and of all the important and possible ministries of the church, this one thing is the main thing. We must preach the Lord Jesus. We must share the gospel. In the New Testament age, it is this word of God carried along and imparted by the Holy Spirit that bears fruit and multiplies. It is the truth of God. It is the word of God that gives life. If you are looking for life today, if you are feeling rather dead spiritually inside today, or if you've come up against dead ends in your world today, I'm telling you it is the word of God that gives life. And these men are preaching the word of God, central to the word of God is the lordship of Jesus Christ. And this may be one reason why we don't know their names, these evangelists from Cyprus and Cyrene, because more important than knowing who they were is knowing what they said. More important than the messenger, more noteworthy than the messenger is the message. They preached the Lord Jesus and the church in Antioch grew. So I asked you at, at the outset, how does the Christian church grow? Greg Beal and Mitchell Kim give us some insight here from their book, God Dwells Among Us. They write, gospel growth is the key to true church growth. Church leaders can often seek programs and marketing processes to accelerate church growth and such programs and processes may have a place however lasting church growth is essentially gospel growth if church growth is based on programs that do not root people in the living word of god then they will in time of testing fall away we must get people to come to church but we must also get the word of god to come to people the only way to integrate people into the body of Christ is by the word of God growing in them. Central to that message, as I've already said, is the lordship of Jesus. When the gospel is preached, when, when Jesus is exalted, then people are likely to get saved. And beyond that, they certainly cannot get saved without it. Right? Right? They cannot get saved without it. Acts, 20, Acts 2.21 says this, Everyone who calls upon the name of what? The Lord shall be saved. Romans 10.9, If you confess with your mouth what? That Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. That's what these men are preaching. And so the welcoming response that they receive in Antioch should be no surprise to, to us. Because Jesus himself said it. It's recorded in John chapter 12, verse 32. And I, when I am lifted up, will draw all people to myself. Now there's a bit of a deeper meaning here, as is often the case in John's gospel. To begin, when I am lifted up. When Jesus says, when I am lifted up, it refers to his death on the cross. And Jesus made that plain in the... Um, in the discourse he had with Nicodemus that Hannah read to us from John chapter 3. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And the occasion in Israel's history that Jesus was referring to, we just heard about during the scripture that Joyce read to us in Numbers 21. The Israelites are in the wilderness. They're wandering around. They're beginning to complain. They, they begin to doubt God. They begin to doubt his goodness. They take issue with how he has provided for them. They take issue with the man that he has appointed to lead them, Moses. And as a result, God sends fiery serpents among them, which is 
terrifying for people like me who can't stand a garter snake. If you think about what this must have been like. And they begin to die from the bites that they are suffering, that are being inflicted on them by these sermons. And they realize that they've been wrong and that they have sinned and that God has sent a judgment upon them. And so what do they do? They turn around and they appeal to Moses to make this stop, to make this go away. And Moses appeals to God and we get this revelation, this idea to, to, to make a bronze serpent and make, a, make, a, make an image of a fiery serpent and to lift it up put it on a stand, and he directed everyone who was afflicted by those serpents, if they are bitten, to look to that image, and they will live and not die. The sin of the people in the wilderness brought death, and the way to avoid that death was to look in faith on the bronze serpent that was lifted up. Similarly, the sin of the people of this world brings death. And the way to escape that death is to look in faith on the Son of God who was lifted up on the cross. To look in faith at the suffering servant who endured so much at the hands of his accusers that his appearance, as the prophet Isaiah put it, was marred beyond human semblance. His form beyond that the children of mankind, when he was lifted up, when the cross to which his bloody body was affixed by nails, driven through his hand and his feet, when that cross is raised and dropped in its stand, he hangs there as the cure for the biting, lethal sting of sin and its consequences. For any and all who will look on him in faith. Jesus is the one who is the cure for sin's consequences. Because on the cross he took those consequences himself. The sinless son of God dies on the cross in our stead. Suffers the death that we deserve that he does not. Readily exchanges there his perfect record of obedience for our record of rebellion willingly submits to suffering and death so we can be healed so we can have everlasting life sin separates us from God and invites death Jesus unites us to God and promises eternal life that's a simple message of the gospel what the apostle Paul summarizes so well in his first letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Here in these verses from 1 Corinthians is another way that Christ is lifted up. Not only is Christ lifted up on the cross, he has literally been lifted up because he was raised from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He sits on his throne in glory at the right hand of God, bearing the name that is above every other name, the name at which every knee will one day bow. He is Lord. That's what the scriptures teach us. That is the truth. Jesus is a living Lord, a resurrected and eternally victorious Lord, calling on any who will trust him to follow him to join his new creation, to become part of his reclaiming work in this world. He was lifted up on the cross. He was lifted into heaven. And the church today lifts him up in proclamation and invitation to the glorious king of kings, saying, come to him. He's the only one who could do what he did. And therefore, he's the only one deserving of your worship. And he's the only one deserving of your life. That's the message. Some form of that is what's being delivered in Antioch as these men from Cyprus and Cyrene are in a sense doing what the preachers before them had been doing, what Peter had been doing, what Stephen had been doing, what Philip had been doing, what Saul was doing, this much announcing, declaring, preaching Jesus with great evangelistic success. So reason number one for the extraordinary fruit from their preaching is that they are preaching the Lord Jesus. They are not preaching moralism. 
which we kind of like. They've not, they're not preaching pragmatism, which I really like. If it works, let's do it. They are, they are not preaching positive thinking like some preachers do. They're not preaching anything but the life, death, resurrection, and imminent return of Jesus Christ. This is Jesus. This is Jesus. This is Jesus. He's for you if you'll have him. He's for you if you'll have him. He's for you if you'll have him. A second reason for their great reception is found in verse 21. And the hand of the Lord was with them. The hand of the Lord was with them. This phrase is a way of saying God was was with these evangelists, was blessing their efforts. Several times in the Old Testament we read about the hand of God. We see how God delivered his people from slavery, from exile, uh, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. As Nehemiah recounted how he was able to do, I don't know if it's been a while since you've read the book of Nehemiah, I always go back and read through again. It's a beautiful book. And as he's recounting how he's able to do what by natural means should not have been done, should not have been able to pull that off, what does he say? He, he attributes it to the good hand of God. These things happen because of the good hand of God on me. The same is true of his counterpart, Ezra, who likewise was able to pull off things that defied the odds in his service to the Lord. And what does he say? He says, the hand of the Lord my God was on me. And here in Acts, the hand of the Lord is with these evangelists. The men from Cyprus and Cyrene are effectively preaching Jesus and seeing people converted because they're walking in the will of the Lord, because they're doing what God wants them to do, where he wants them to do it, how he wants them to do it, in the power that he is supplying them to do the work. And the hand of the Lord will be with you if you choose to do the work of the Lord. The hand of the Lord will be on all who would genuinely want to preach the Lord Jesus. I want that to be an encouragement to you today. I hope that that would embolden you to share the good news. Is it the, the true power in preaching, and when I say preaching, I'm not talking about doing what I'm doing up here. I'm talking about evangelism. I'm talking about sharing Christ. And the true power in that is not as the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians in words of eloquent wisdom, but in the message of the cross. There's the power. The power is in the message of the cross. It is the message, not the messenger, that is the story. And we can get so caught up, can't we, in worrying about how we're going to come across, if we get it exactly right, if we're going to mumble, if we stumble, if we stutter, if we mess it up. That's not where the power is. If the Lord is encouraging you or allowing paths to cross in front of you with people who need to hear about Jesus, preach the Lord Jesus and trust in the message of the cross that the Holy Spirit will do with your stammering tongue what you cannot do. This is how it works. And it's important for us to keep that in mind so that we would then be emboldened or brave enough to at least give it a shot. As the old Scottish Baptist preacher Alexander McLaren put it in one of his commentaries, he said, there is a universal obligation on all Christians to share the message, to make known Christ. That we were saved for his glory, for our good, but for the sake of others. To take this message and, and, and to preach and, and share this message with others. And a lot of times we can be afraid to share the gospel. We don't feel qualified. Proverbs 29, 25 is right. The fear of man lays a snare. It's the fear of man. It's, I'm, I'm not going to get this exactly right. It lays a snare. Fear can prevent us from sharing the good news, can't it? But Carl Henry, right, uh, Henry rightly points out to us, it's only good news if it gets there in time. So we could feel unfit for the task, and most of us do. And by nature, we may be unfit for the task. Well, what does 2 Corinthians teach? It teaches this. We have this treasure. 
the Apostle Paul, is we have this treasure, which is the gospel, in jars of clay. In fragile, imperfect, flawed, nondescript, unremarkable when compared to the contents, vessels, God mercifully uses broken containers, blemished bodies to deliver the treasure of his gospel to show. We are even told why. Not only that he does this, but this is why. To show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not us. We are broken. We are flawed. We are imperfect. The, the closer we draw to Jesus, the more aware we are of this reality. Our inadequacy and our limitations and our inability even to live up always to the things that we truly, truly believe and love. We're broken, but we don't glory in our brokenness, beloved. Any more that we can defer to it as an excuse or a reason to not share Jesus. We are to do our best for God. Amen? The old hymn writer has it right. Give of your best to the master. Give of your best to the master. And at the same time, we rest in this truth. That the success of our efforts to honor the Lord does not rest in our adequacy or skill. It is the guarantee of God's presence with his saints in the proclamation of the gospel that provides the efficacy for the message that leads to the expansion of the kingdom. It is the guarantee of God's presence with you while you preach, teach, share. It is his presence with you that brings the power of the message to bear on the person who is willing to receive the message. It's his work and the promise of that presence that God is with you. When is God with you, church? When is he with you? Right, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Every other Sunday. No, this is, this is why this doesn't need to be so intimidating and why it's simple and profound in its simplicity. The presence of God is ours always. Every believer has this promise given by Jesus when he said, all authority is given to me. And he sends us out to go and make disciples with the Great Commission. And he says, I am with you always. Oh. The hand of the Lord will be with all who genuinely want to preach the Lord Jesus. So let me encourage you to give a little, to rethink this and not give so much thought to your eloquence or your performance and simply to be willing and available to share the Lord with those in need. Let me challenge you to ask honest questions of unbelievers. Ask them, what do you think about Jesus? Ask heartfelt questions of those who are looking for those answers. Have you considered Jesus? Ask provocative questions to those that Paul wrote to Timothy describing as ever searching and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Do you have any of those people in your life who's always looking but never seem to be able to decide? Never seem to come to a knowledge of the truth. Who, who very much more like the journey than they do the destination. Ask them. You've looked here. You've looked there. You've looked here. Why don't you look into Jesus? You can do that, can't you? Provoke them a little bit to consider it. Because Henry's right. The good news is only good news if it gets there on time. Trust the presence of God, not your presentation. Hear that? Trust the presence of God, not your presentation. 
and the hand of the Lord will be with you. McLaren goes on to say, and and we'll, we'll close with this thought. Preaching Christ in the sense in which that expression is used in the New Testament implies no one special method of proclaiming the glad tidings. A word written in a letter to a friend, a sentence dropped in casual conversation, a lesson to a child on a mother's lap, or any other way by which to any listeners the great story of the cross is told is as truly often more truly preaching Christ as the set discourse which has usurped the name. We profess to believe in the priesthood of all believers. Are we ready to recognize it as laying a very real responsibility upon us and involving a very practical inference as to our own conduct? We all have the power, therefore we all have the duty. For what purpose did God give us the blessing of knowing Christ ourselves? Not for our own well-being alone, but that through us the blessing might be still further diffused. Heaven doth with us as men with torches do, not light them for themselves. God hath shined into our hearts that we might give to others the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Every Christian is solemnly bound to fulfill this divine intention and to take heed to the imperative command freely Ye have received, freely give. Let's stand and sing our concluding hymn.